When I was listening to them uh, practicing this morning, I said, come on guys, how am I supposed to follow that? (laughs) Good job, y'all nailed it. In a way though, that song is perfect for what we're talking about because when we talk about love breaking through, one of the things that I want to talk about this morning is a barrier that we often run into, a barrier to that love. And it's a barrier to receiving that love. It's a question that I have had often in life, and it can be boiled down to something just as simple as this. Why do some people have it so hard in life? Why do some people have it so hard in life? Things that happen to them, tragedies that befall them, born into situations that are far beyond their control and are bad. I want to read a poem that captures at least a feeling of this to some degree. And it's not a big tragedy, but it's one of those small things that can cut and impact who we are and who we grow to be. It's called Dim by Jim Daniels. Today my son realized someone smarter than him Not me or his mom. He still thinks we know everything. One of the other kids, Nathan, making fun of him at the computer terminal for screwing up at the math game. The other kids laughing at him. Second grade. I'm never going to be as smart as him, he says. I'm never going to be half as smart as some of my students, if we're talking IQ. But he doesn't want me to explain. He wants me to acknowledge that he's dumb. He's lying in bed and taking his glasses off and on, trying to get them perfectly clean for the morning. I'm looking around his dark room for a joke or some decent words to lay on him. His eyes are glassy with almost tears. Second grade. The world wants to call on him. I take his hand in mine. And again, I wonder, why do some have it so hard in life? Why are some smarter than others, better athletes, have the gift of compassion, the ability to form complex thoughts, hold multiple variables in their heads while they crunch numbers, while others cannot? Why are some born with sight and others are not? Why are some struck by tragedy? That's exactly what the disciples wanted to know when they happened upon a blind man. Thanks. As he, Jesus, walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. The disciples seized this opening as a chance to answer that big theological question that we still wrestle with today. Rabbi, teacher, who sinned? This man or his parents that he was born blind. Now, it was a fair question for them. Their Hebrew scriptures were chock full of examples, which clearly stated that God punishes children for the sins of their father, even to the third and fourth generations. Now, on the other hand, they also knew the prophets like Ezekiel and Jeremiah, who differed and said that children would not be punished for their forebearers' sins, and argued that individuals will be punished for their actions as individuals. 
So the disciples were thinking that this blindness must have been a direct result of sin, some sin, be it this man's, his parents, or even further back generationally. And they wanted to know, Jesus, where do you come down on this? Was it this guy or was it his parents that got him into this mess? It's got to be either one or the other, right? I hope that's a trigger for you if you're here last week. It's got to be either one or the other. Someone has to be to blame when things go wrong. If you were here last week, you saw how I embarrassed myself when I uh, sort of accused Marty Hollinger, God bless her, of appropriating my Pilot G2 ink pen. I'd seen the situation as an either or, and I didn't leave room for a third option. Turns out Pam gave it to her earlier. My silliness. I was thinking like the disciples were. It's got to be one way or the other. But then Jesus does what Jesus does so often. He turns convention on its head. He rejects the either-or paradigm, and he reframes the entire question, the entire matter, actually. He says, neither this man nor his parents sinned. Whew. That's a relief. Because we all know that a loving God doesn't punish like this, doesn't punish somebody now because of generations three and four generations ago did something wrong. That's not fair. We don't understand God to be like that. And here's another thing. If the man was born blind, how could he have sinned? Does a fetus sin? I don't think so. But then... Unfortunately, Jesus goes on. The man was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. Wait a minute. I don't like this. The man was born blind so that God's works could be revealed. This is what I wish Jesus had never said. Because he seems to be saying that this man was born blind. Born blind in an era where being blind severely limited your life. That was a time when people could, would come up to you and say, well, I wonder if it was you who sinned or your parents who sinned that got you into this predicament that you're blind. Can you imagine? The man was born blind so that God's works could be revealed years later when Jesus would happen to be strolling by with his disciples and he would come by and heal him. Is that how God works? Because the man gets healed in the very next verses. I don't know about you, but this God as puppet master doesn't work real well for me. If, if God operates this way, if God strikes people with hardship so that later they can be healed, so that God and Jesus will somehow be made to look good, I need to readjust my understanding of a so-called loving God. That doesn't seem quite right to me. I don't know about you. And so I've struggled with this text and others like it for years because we know that our world is filled with not only blindness, but hunger and injustice, war and displacement like Carla was just talking about a few minutes ago. Our world has abuse. So recently, I don't know if you read the news, this piece in the news, recently, we're, was it all because God wants God's works to be revealed that a landslide happened in a garbage dump? in Addis Ababa in Ethiopia and killed 50 people? Is it so that God's works can be revealed that kids get cancer? Whatever personal or family struggles that we might have, struggles with physical or mental illness, loss or pain, are these all set up so that God can come and swoop in and save the day later on? Except, of course, when God does not come in and swoop the day, swoop, swoop in and save the day later on. Then I came across how Eugene Peterson interprets this scripture in the message. He interprets it this way. He says, Jesus answers the disciples akin to this. 
Jesus says, you're asking the wrong question about this man's blindness. You're looking for someone to blame. There is no such cause and effect here. Instead, look for what God can do. Hmm. Instead, look for what God can do. In this view, hardship is not set up for some future action to make God look good. In this view, hardship is just life. And when hardship is part of life and God is not puppeteering at all, then God is ready to be in the business of love and potential. For me, this turned everything around. If I stop playing the blame game long enough, I can see that the cause of this man's blindness might have been a million other things that I know can be true. A genetic misfire, improper prenatal care in a world before modern medicine, a drought that affected the mother's nutrition while pregnant. You know, one of the most troubling things that I see in pastoral ministry, and I think my fellow pastors would agree, is the way that we limit ourselves based on what has happened to us in the past. We think things like, and these are, these are things I've heard, I know the solution to the problem at work, but like my dad always told me, I was the hard worker, not the smart one. Who am I to make a suggestion? Well, I guess my happy days are over now that my spouse is ill. That's not me to wear that handsome suit or that pretty dress. They laughed at me the last time I did. I can't be the one to confront Uncle George on his racist comments. I'm just the lowly nephew. Hug my family to show them how much I love them? It's not really the way it was when I grew up. Listen, we don't know why bad things happen. Jesus didn't explain it. He didn't tell us why bad things happen to good or bad people. Sometimes a kid just isn't as good at math as his classmates, like in that poem. Cancer or genetic illness, the death of a loved one, war and drought, systemic racism or sexism or poverty or an abusive family system. Not God's judgment. And also, not God stacking the deck so that God can swoop in and save the day later on. It's life. But here's the thing, it's life and, and we have a choice about how we will respond. We can choose not to respond. We can choose to stay in those same systems. We can choose to keep thinking those negative things that have been heaped upon us. Or we can look for what God can do. People are handed these situations every single day. And those who are healthy in the days and the months and the years after are the one, ones who put aside blame or guilt and they make room for God's potential, even in pain and difficulty. And they work at it. Did you catch the last verse there? Did you catch that first part of the last verse? We, this is Jesus talking, we must work the works of him who sent me. In other words, God. Jesus doesn't say, I'm working the works. Jesus says, we must work the works. And the implication I get is that it is with God. Quick story. If there's anybody who had the right to blame, it was a woman called Jessica Sherman, a 20-year-old British woman who woke up in the hospital last month after an epileptic attack. Her memory was wiped clean. She didn't recognize her parents. She didn't recognize her doting boyfriend, Rich Bishop. Can you imagine? Don't know anybody. Well, Jessica 
because this guy was a stranger, this boyfriend, tried to end their relationship. But Rich vowed to win her heart back. And so he took her on walks in familiar parks and to their favorite restaurants. And eventually, Rich won her over again. I don't remember the first time I fell in love with Rich, says Jessica, but I do remember the second. Instead of looking for someone to blame, some sort of cosmic cause and effect, Jessica and Rich looked for what could be done, what God could do. I wonder what that place is for you. I wonder what that place is for us, where we need to break the pattern and we need to look for what God can do in a way that we've never seen it before. And I'm sure some of you, all of you actually, know people who we have seen break this pattern, these patterns, who have not let tragedy or hardship define them. And I know that because many of them are in this room. They are you. When we look for what God can do and we work with God, the world is an entirely different place. It's a place where a father can clean his son's glasses and take him by the hand and lead him to math class. It's a place where these systems of racism and sexism and war and poverty and abuse can be broken. Because we have the potential. And because God has the potential. And because when we work with God, oh my goodness, look out world.